Good morning. I'd like to welcome you this morning to Southern Hills United Methodist Church. We are so happy to have you here to worship with us. I have just a few announcements for today. First, from the United Methodist Men, today is the last Sunday that you can turn in scholarship applications. Please see Larry Warner or Orville Corbishley. Tomorrow night is the United Methodist Women Monthly Meeting at 6 p.m., and they will be serving dinner. So if you want to eat and come to the meeting, please do so. Next Sunday, next Monday, February 24th at 6.30 p.m., there is a parents' meeting for the Children's Department, and Debbie Schultz uh, will be conducting that meeting here in the sanctuary. And finally, something very nice that's coming up a couple of weeks, but I thought I'd mention it. Two young men, Michael Hagee and Zach Schneeberger, are going to be involved in an Eagle Scout Court of Honor through the Boy Scouts, and that is quite an accomplishment. So if you choose to come, that will be at uh, 1 p.m. in the main sanctuary in the CLC. Let's have a blessed morning and be in an attitude of worship. When we say yes to God, we choose to follow God's ways and to live as Christ lived. Today, let us say yes. This is the day the Lord has made. We come rejoicing and giving thanks. This is the day God invites us to love and to live. We seek to dwell in God's love as we turn our hearts towards God. This is the day to worship our Creator and our Redeemer. We worship the God of life. The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ my Lord. She is his new creation by water and the She blesses, partakes one holy food, and to one hope she presses with every grace and due. Mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war, she waits the of peace forevermore till with a vision glorious our longing eyes are blessed and the great church victorious shall be the church at rest yet she on earth hath Almighty God, we gather in this space to praise your name. Help us lay aside our worries, our fears, our frustrations, and our anxieties, that we may be free to truly worship you. 
Through the power of your spirit, empower us to seek your ways. Walk in the footsteps of Christ. Come before you with our whole heart and live as your faithful servants. We seek your help this day, O God, that the world may know your abundant love and your amazing grace. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Glory be to the Father. If you're trying to find your place, you are welcome to be seated. Friends, a lot of you have asked me uh, how Bo is doing because this is the second week he hasn't been with us. And he was under the weather this past week a little bit, um, but that's not why he hasn't been here. Last week, Bo was on a retreat, an annual one that he takes with some friends. He's been doing that a very long time. And today we had a request from a, a colleague out in Lawton. Uh, needed to be out of the pulpit and asked if we could send Bo out that way to fill in. And so today he's preaching out there. He'll be back here uh, next week. He's going to be sharing the message with us next Sunday morning. But he was under the weather. He was, he was here last night uh, dancing up a storm, having a good time with some other people who are dancing up the storm. And, and I'm not saying anything, but there may be some video of you all floating around somewhere out there too. So we had a great time last night, and I want to thank the United Methodist Men, um, the leadership from that group, and everybody who made that a fun evening. It's a great time every single year, and, and last night was no exception, so thank you for that. Holy One, stir our sense of wonder and curiosity that your holy word may come alive for us in new and wondrous ways. Open our ears and our hearts to your word of life today. Amen. Look here, today I've set before you life and what's good versus death and what's wrong. If you obey the Lord, God, the Lord your God's commandments that I'm commanding you right now by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, and by keeping his commandments, his regulations, and his case laws, then you will live and thrive, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you refuse to listen, and, are, and so are misled, worshiping other gods and serving them, I'm telling you right now that you will definitely die. You will not prolong your life on the fertile land that you're crossing the Jordan River to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth as my witnesses against you right now. I've set life and death, blessing and curse, before you. Now choose life so that your, you and your descendants will live by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, and by clinging to him. That's how you will survive and live long on the fertile land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Your word is a lamp to my peace. And a light to my path. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed, Blessed are those who keep God's, God's testimonies, who, who seek God, God with, with their, their whole heart, heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in God's ways. You, you have commanded, commanded your, your precepts, precepts to be, to be kept, kept diligently. diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then, then I, I shall not, not be put, put to shame, shame having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous ordinances. I will observe your statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly.
couple of weeks, you'll notice that the gospel seems like it's in an odd place for a service like this. That's because when you have four readings in a service, it's customary, uh, particularly in the Protestant church, to place the scripture that you're preaching about closest to the message. And so because I'm working out of 1 Corinthians right now, the gospel comes a little bit earlier in the service. So I'm going to ask you to stand as you're able as we read the gospel this morning. (laughs) You've heard that it was said to those who lived long ago, don't commit murder. And all who commit murder will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that anyone who is angry with their brother or sister will be in danger of judgment. If they say to their brother or sister, you idiot, they will be in danger of being condemned by the governing council. And if they say, you fool, they'll be in danger of a fiery hell. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave your gift at the altar and go. First, make things right with your brother or sister, and then come back and offer your gift. Be sure to make friends quickly with your opponents while you're with them on the way to court. Otherwise, they will haul you before the judge. The judge will turn you over to the officer of the court, and you'll be thrown into prison. I say to you in all seriousness that you won't get out of there until you've paid every last penny. You've heard that it was said, don't commit adultery. But I say to you that every man who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. And if your right eye causes you to fall into sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better that you lose a part of your body than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to fall into sin, chop it off and throw it away. It's better that you lose a part of your body Then let your whole body go into hell. It was said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a divorce certificate. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual unfaithfulness, forces her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you've heard that it was said to those who lived long ago, don't make a false solemn pledge, but you should follow through on what you've pledged to the Lord. I say to you that you must not pledge at all. You must not pledge by heaven because it's God's throne. You must not pledge by the earth because it's God's footstool. You must not pledge by Jerusalem because it's the city of the great king. And you must not pledge by your head because you can't turn one hair white or black. Let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. Jesus is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Come on up here, everybody. There's plenty of room. Go ahead and have a seat, guys. Come on up. If you're on your way, come on up here. There's plenty of room. How are you doing today? Yes. Yes. All right. Well, I'm going I'm to teach you a couple of words today in a different language. I speak, the, I speak a, another language. I speak a couple of them. One of the languages I learned is a, a language that is native to Oklahoma. Have you ever been around one of the Indian tribes here in Oklahoma? You know we have a lot of them. You know, do you have any? Has anybody ever told you how many different Indian tribes we have here in the state of Oklahoma? If you had to guess, how many tribes do you think are here? That's a lot, but that's, yeah, 200 good. What do you think? 103, okay, it's also a good number. Anybody else? What do you think? That's a thousand, man. We are enjoying some Indian stuff. Actually, it's uh, 38. There are 38 federally recognized tribes right here in Oklahoma. So the one that I'm a member of is the Cherokee Nation. You ever heard of the Cherokee Nation? Yeah. So their, their tribal headquarters is in the eastern part of the state, and that's where uh, my family's from a long way back. So when I was young, uh, I was kind of blessed. I didn't know this was unusual at the time, but I was blessed to be a part of a family that still spoke that language, so I learned how to speak the Cherokee language. Really, really hard language to learn how to speak, I think, if you don't grow up learning it. So I'm going to teach you a couple of words, because they're important words. The first one is how to say hello. You want to learn how to say hello? In Cherokee, the word for hello is OCO. Can you say OCO? Now, nobody actually says the O. So we just kind of like when you say hi to somebody in English, sometimes you just say, sometimes you'll say hello, right? But most of the time you say hi, or you say, hey, how you doing, something like that. So in Cherokee, we don't use the O, we just say C-O. Can you say C-O? C-O. So that means hello. Um, Tohichu. Can you say Dohichu? Tohichu. That means how are you doing, right? So if I was going to say, hey, how are you? I would say, oh, C-O, Dohichu. Or I'd say, C-O, Dohichu, something like that. So to say, I'm doing really good, which is the response, you'd say, Dohikwa. Can you say Dohikwa? Yeah. So... The most important word that I'm going to teach you this morning is Yona. Can you say Yona? Yona. Yona means bear in Cherokee. And the reason that Yona is the most important word that I'm going to teach you this morning is because Yona was the name of my little dog who was about this big. He, he, if he was on my lap, he'd be about this big and he'd stand this tall. So we named him Bear because we thought it was funny because he was so small, you know, so we named him Bear in Cherokee. His name was Yona. And he was a great little puppy. I loved him to death. He was always getting into mischief. Now, Yona's best friend was our other dog. He was a big Siberian Husky. Have you ever seen one of those? And he also had a Cherokee. It's a big, did you? Okay, yeah. So Siberian Huskies are big and real fluffy dogs, right? Um, he also had a Cherokee name. His Cherokee name was Waya. Can you say Waya? Waya means wolf. And, uh, you know, you would think that we named them that because they kind of look like wolves. But actually, my Cherokee name is Quayanega, which is white wolf. That's, and so he's kind of named after me. So Waya and Yona are best friends. Waya is about this tall. Yona is about this tall. And Yona is the one who is in charge. Waya is a big softie. Like, he is a big teddy bear. When the girls were young, they used to ride him around the backyard. He, they would put a, a harness on him with a leash, and they'd sit in a wagon. And, or on a skateboard, and he would pull them down the sidewalk in front of our house. He just thought it was the greatest thing, and so did they. So a lot of fun, big heart, super nice dog. Well, one day, we were living in a parsonage in a small town where I was serving as a minister, and it didn't have a very good sign. So I went to the church, and I said, uh, you know, if, if I pay for the materials and do the labor, would you be all right with me putting a fence around the, the backyard? And they said, sure, we'd be glad to do that. So I'd done it before, so I got to work with, uh, with Megan's help, building a fence, built a big wooden fence. Took a little while, you know, those, those things don't go up fast, so it took me a few weeks, but a few weeks later, I'd gotten this fence finished, and now I had a place for the dogs to run around in the backyard without us having to worry about it, which was great. So we put him out in the backyard, and why is really big, right? So it's kind of hard for him to find ways to get out of the backyard under the fence, but Yona is tiny, right? And so it turns out, that I hadn't built this fence as well as I thought I had, 
And there was a space there where there was just enough room for Yona to squeeze out under the fence. So wouldn't you know it, one day I get a call from Kate. She said, hey, I don't think Yona's in the backyard. Now, we got scared. Have you ever lost a, a dog or a cat? One of them has run away, and you have to find, oh, man, that's a scary thing. So we went, got in my truck. I had a pickup truck at the time, and we're driving around because it's hard to, to find. When you get a, a little dog that gets out, it's really tough to find him. So we're driving, we're driving really slowly, looking at the houses, trying to figure out where he might be hiding. And I get a phone call from a friend of mine who's a few blocks away. Now this is a small town, so he lives on some land and he has some horses. And he calls me and he said, hey, do you have a little dog? And he describes Yona. And I said, yeah, and he got out and I'm looking for him. And he said, well, I think he's over here in my pasture. I said, what is he doing in your pasture? And he said, he got over here and he started chasing my horses. Now, my dog's this big, right? And he started chasing the horses. And he said, now, I don't want you to worry. Now, I'm thinking that's exactly the kind of thing Yona would do because Yona thinks he's a great Dane. You know, he thinks he's a lot bigger than he actually is. And I thought, that's exactly the kind of thing Yona would do. And I started to laugh a little bit. He said, oh, no, 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 no. He got kicked in the head by one of those horses. And he's bleeding pretty bad. So we went over and we found him. We picked him up. We were carrying him. Um, Megan was in the back seat of the truck, and she had him on her, on her lap. We took him to the vet. The, vets, the vet office there, those people were members of our church, so we went to the vet, and we saw them, and we were really scared. Yona was not acting like himself, um, so we were really worried about him. We took him to the vet, and they kept him for two or three days and treated him and said they thought he would be okay. Oddly enough, he was a lot nicer after that. I think that horse may have literally kicked some sense into his head, but... He was a lot easier to get along with, so we took him back home. What do you think I did? Once Yona was recovered and, and he was taken care of and he healed, what do you think I did? I went right out there and I fixed that fence. Why? Why would I do that? Because I don't want that to happen again. Why don't I want that to happen again? Yona wanted to get out. He thought it was a great, he was just having great fun running around that little town we lived in. Why didn't I want him to do that? Well, when he got out, what happened to him? He got hurt pretty bad. Yeah, so here's what I want you to remember. Sometimes rules are like fences. We don't always understand why they're there. Sometimes we think that the only thing they're there to do is keep us from having fun. When in reality, just like Yona, some of those rules, the rules that we get from our parents or from our schools, or from the, the people who take care of us. Sometimes we feel like those rules are just there to keep us from having fun. But in reality, just like Yona, sometimes those rules keep us safe from things that we don't even know are there to hurt us. So the next time somebody gives you a rule and you don't understand why it's there, I want you to remember that that person probably loves you dearly and is doing the best they can to keep you safe. Can you remember that for me? All right, let's pray together. Um, at the end of the prayer, I'm going to say, and all the people said, and I want you to join me and say amen. Can we do that? Let's pray. God, we are grateful for fences, and we are grateful for rules, even when we don't understand them, even when we don't understand why they're there. Pray, God, that you would help us to remember that even when we don't understand the rules that are placed upon us by the people that love us, help us to remember how much they love us and that they're trying to protect us. And all the people said Thank you so much for coming up this morning. I think Mrs. Schultz is ready to take you to Children's Church. I swear I thought that dog was going to be the death of me. You ever heard me tell the story about paying $5 for a dog that I adopted and then that dog getting uh, impounded over and over again at the cost of $50? That dog. All right, friends, we're in um, Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth today. Um, Corinth was a deeply troubled church. 
So Paul is in the process of trying to establish churches around the known world, and he's doing that very strategically. Paul knows that if he can establish the faith in the major centers of trade in the known world, that people will come to those cities to trade from, from all over the place, and they'll encounter this new faith and the teachings of Christ, and they'll take those teachings of Christ back to where they are. The only thing Paul, uh, and you get this from his readings, the only thing he was ever interested in was making sure that those teachings, the teachings of Christ, got passed on. And over and over again, Paul encounters people who want to be his followers, you know, who want to be baptized. When you're baptized in the ancient world, you're baptized into discipleship. That means you become someone's disciple. People keep wanting to be baptized into Paul. That's the way he uses that language. And Paul says, no, 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 no. The only thing we're here to do is pass on the teachings of Christ. Paul was... Uh, good about that. So Corinth is deeply troubled because as is the case in any place where the teachings of Christ begin to take root, people take that and they learn it and they grow at different rates. So they end up trying to retain some of their past normal behavior even as they're living into what they're learning. In Corinth that meant they were doing some strange things. There were incestuous relationships that Paul is writing about um, they were doing. They were keeping certain people from participating in what you and I would consider communion. But communion back then was a meal. Uh, the altar, the communion table, was a table because it was just a meal. There were a lot of things that were happening there that were unhealthy spiritual practices. There's a lot of gossip. There's a lot of uh, backstabbing in the the emerging community that is the church. So Paul's going to write a letter to Corinth, and he's going to chastise them. There are two major, now, as is the case with any scriptural passage, we could talk about it all day. Anytime you encounter the scriptures, the Holy Spirit is going to pull something out for you to learn. Today I want to focus on two of the major lessons here. So, Paul to the church in Corinth. Brothers and sisters, I wouldn't talk to you like spiritual people, but like unspiritual people, like babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink instead of solid food because you were not up to it yet. Now, you're still not up to it because you're still unspiritual. When jealousy and fighting exist between you, aren't you unspiritual and living by human standards? When someone says, I belong to Paul, and someone else says, I belong to Apollos. Apollos was one of the, uh, the people who had emerged as a teacher in the community of faith. Aren't you acting like people without the spirit? After all, what is Apollos? What is Paul? They're servants who help you to believe. Paul always believed that his only purpose was to connect people to God. Each one had a role given to them by the Lord. I planted, Apollos watered, but God made it grow. Because of this, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. But the only one who is anything is God who makes it grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together. But each one will receive their own reward for their own labor. We are God's co-workers. You are God's field. You are what God is building. Jesus is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Melt us and mold us, fill us and use us. But Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us. Amen. All right, so as, as I mentioned, uh, anytime you encounter the Scriptures, God's going to teach you something. Never, never read the scriptures apart from the Holy Spirit. Some of the most dangerous acts in history have occurred because people thought they understood for themselves what the Bible was saying. I've said this before. You'll probably hear me say it again. Anytime somebody comes to me and says something like, I, I know what the Bible says, I've known, I, I know what the Bible says, and I believe it, and nobody's going to change my mind about it, I always get a little worried, I always cringe, because the most famous person that you know to have quoted that statement was Adolf Hitler. Always be careful. Read the scriptures together with the Holy Spirit, 
and together with the community of faith. When you do, you're going to learn something every time. Today, I want to focus on what I think are two major lessons that come out of this passage. And the first of them has to do with what the church actually is. I always wonder when I read a passage of Scripture, who you, who, who you identify with. Who, who, when you're reading this, who is it that you identify with? Paul's going to use a farming metaphor here because that's the metaphor that speaks to the people that he's talking to. I'm going to use a little bit of a ranching metaphor this morning. And I understand that we live in Oklahoma City, but I suspect that you've spent some time outside of Oklahoma City, and I hope that you can relate to that. All right, so one of my favorite things to do is to go up to Sterling, Kansas. Uh, I shared with you last week or the week before about what's going on at my sister's house. Many of you came up to me and and were um, very caring and kind. You've shared that you're praying for them. They're doing they're doing well. They're in the process of finding out how long it's going to take for their home to be rebuilt. If you're uh, catching up, didn't hear that last week. My sister's uh, my sister's family lost their their home uh, a few weeks ago in a house fire. And so one of my favorite things to do has always been to go up to that farmstead. Now they've lived there for five generations. My brother-in-law John Odin is a, a sixth generation farmer right there in Sterling, Kansas. Here's what that looks like. They farm. Uh, 4,000 acres around Sterling, and they graze another 2,000 acres. Really hard to find uh, contiguous tracts of land like that in Oklahoma because so much of Oklahoma was subdivided, but you can still find that up in Kansas. So I've always enjoyed going up there. My family has done three things uh, historically. We have been preachers, we have been teachers, or we have been farmers, and that's about all that any of us have ever done, and then several generations of us seem to have found our way into the military. So I grew up um, spending time at my grandparents' house. Both of my grandparents were farmers. One of them was a moisture tester. Uh, he serviced moisture testers and grain elevators all throughout the upper Midwest. Another one lived on a farm. And so it was kind of a, a good fit when my sister went to Kansas State University, fell in love with a guy who was going to go back and run the family farm, moved back there. Uh, it was humorous because we did grow up in Kansas City. And so uh, watching her kind of take to country life was a little bit like watching an ongoing episode of Green Acres, if you remember that show from, from a long time ago. And I always got a kick out of that. And so uh, I loved going out there. I loved being able to be there because I always got a chance to go out and help work on John's farm. Now, more than anything, I enjoyed working with cattle, always enjoyed working with cattle, something I would love to do if I could. Um, one year, John decided he was going to get into bison. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had the joy of working with bison, but I learned some things I didn't know. For the starter, I mean, they're beautiful. He had a, at one point, he had a herd of about 60, and I remember going out with all the kids, all, the, uh, all of my, my kids and one of my sister's kids and my other sister's kids, and we're all, everybody's out to go feed the bison, and we're all sitting on the back of John's flatbed, just crowded on there, and John, uh, my brother-in-law, he's driving around, and, you know, a, a, a good rancher will train cattle or bison to come at the honk of a horn, you know, so you can feed them in one spot. So we've got the pellets ready, and the kids are going to hand feed the bison these pellets off the back of the, the flatbed. And so John starts honking, first time I ever saw them all together, and all of these bison come uh, running over the, the rolling hills that are there in Sterling, Kansas. And in my brain, I, ju I can just imagine what it must have been like to see thousands of them running across the prairie here in Oklahoma. I, I can't imagine. Well, I learned some things about bison. I learned that... Uh, Compared to cattle, which can be fast, bison are really fast. I didn't know this, but uh, uh, they're called bison, by the way. Never call them buffalo to a rancher. Um, a buffalo is a water buffalo from Africa. These are bison. So bison can, get this, jump 12 feet from a standing position. I had no idea about that. You know, I assumed they could probably get some air, right? Um, I, I can't tell you how many times John and Heather would come down to visit us and have to go back home because their cattle got out. And somebody called them and said, hey, fence is down, cattle are out. They had to go back up, get the cattle back in uh, and fix the fence. Bison 
they'll, if, if you have a regular fence, just a regular normal wire fence, that, that's like, I mean, that just doesn't stop them. They'll go right through that anytime they feel like going through it. Or they'll just jump over it. I mean, they'll just, when you're working them in cattle facilities, they can jump right over anything. And so John calls one day and he's like, hey, I've got to build some new facilities for these bison because I can't keep them in. They just jump over everything. I was like, okay. And so I went up to help. My other brother-in-law went up to help and some of the other farmhands that live and work up there, they were up there helping. But when I got up there to the area he was going to build the facilities. Now, if that's new language for you, facilities are where you work cattle. That's where you bring them in to give them inoculations. It's where you um, pass them through to load and unload them if you're going to transport them somewhere. So there are a series of pens where you can kind of narrow them down and get them into the area you want them to be in, right? Uh, There are gates and doors that open in different ways. And um, So he said, I need to build some facilities to work the bison. Okay. I get there, and he's already started. And these facilities, now usually when you work cattle, um, you're working cattle in facilities that have gates, you know, gate-type fences. They're not super tall. They're not real short. But they're also, you can see through the gates, right? I get there, and I see this facility that looks like something out of Jurassic Park. The facilities are 15, the walls are 15 feet high, made of solid steel, right? And he's got walkways around the top, and I'm like, John, are we hurting a tyrannosaur? What are we trying to work through these facilities here? And so I get there, and you know, they're welding and getting uh, things done. And, and it, it's a neat experience, right? I've never seen anything like this before. And that's where I learned that we have to do this because the bison can jump 12 feet from a standing position. So we have to, um, we have to get 15-foot facilities. We start welding. It takes a long time. They get put together. They look really cool. Fast forward a little while, a few weeks later. John is like, hey, I need to work some cattle. You want to come up and help? Sure, not a problem. Get in there. He's decided to work the cattle in the bison facility. So we've got these cattle that are in these uh, facilities that are made for dinosaurs, and it, it just looks ridiculous, right? So we're in there working the cattle, um, and there's a. You've got to be careful when you choose to stand between a cow and the only place that the cow feels like it can get to for safety. Sometimes a cow will bluff you, and sometimes they will not bluff you, and you need to know the difference because they're bigger than you and they're fast. You wouldn't think they are, but they are. And, and so I'm standing there, and there's a cow, and John told me this particular cow likes to bluff a lot, and, and I'm um, helping John to separate the, the cattle out so he can work this one. And this cow stands there and starts to, to bluff me a little bit, and I, you know, I, I decide I'm not going to take it. And it turns out that that day the cow was not bluffing, and so... It just takes off and comes straight at me, right? And I'm not as experienced at any of this as John is, but John has figured out that the cow is not bluffing long before I ever do. And so I'm watching this cow come at me, right? And it's every, this is one of those moments where everything happens in slow motion, right? The cow, cows are not particularly majestic creatures. So here in my mind, this cow is running at me, bounding in slow motion, coming straight at me in these facilities that are 15 feet. I'm literally, at this point, I'm thinking, I wonder if I can get over the edge of the wall of the 15-foot high dinosaur facilities that we just built. Cow's running straight at me, and all of a sudden, I just get hit. Like, I get hit incredibly hard. And I'm thinking to myself, I never knew that this is what it would feel like, you know, to get trampled by an animal. And I'm starting to come to my senses when I realize that it's not the cow on top of me. It's my brother-in-law, John, who played linebacker for Kansas State University. (laughs) Paul wants to teach the, the church in Corinth a lesson because they're having some trouble, right? I'm going to talk about unspiritual behavior in just a minute, but this church in Corinth, they, they are really struggling. And so he says, you know, here, here's the thing, church. Let me use a farming metaphor for you. you when you've got, you've got the, these people who plant, right? You've got Apollos and you've got Paul. They're the equivalent of your ministers. That's who later will be your ministers. He said, one of you plants and one of you waters. He said, but you're trying to, to decide which of us you want to support. There's this great 
um, divisiveness that has erupted in Corinth. People are saying that they're going to go into Apollo's camp, or they're going to go into Paul's camp, and if you're in Paul's camp, you can't like the people in Apollo's camp, and if you're in Apollo's camp, you can't like the people who are in Paul's camp. Never tween the two shall meet. Why? Because for some reason, all throughout human history, we have always really wanted to be mad at each other about things. So Paul says, here you are, you're arguing about things, and in addition to that, uh, if you read through the rest of Corinth, you're going to find out that somebody is having an inappropriate relationship with his aunt. You're going to find out that they have this whole stratification system for who can and cannot participate in the, what we would call the communion meals. And Paul says, you're getting this all wrong. You're getting all of the teachings of Christ all wrong. Here's the thing. He said, when you're talking, we're talking about who, to whom we give our allegiance, let's look at it this way. Let's use a farming metaphor, he says. He said, some people plant the seeds, and other people water those seeds. And he said, I, and in this case, I was the one who did the planting. I came to you, and I planted the seeds. And then Apollos came to you, and Apollos watered those seeds. But friends, it's God who makes those seeds grow into a harvest that is worth reaping. Now, it seems to make sense, except that what Paul's really saying is not immediately obvious. Let me update the language a little bit. He finishes by saying, friends, you're what's being grown. Churches have a tendency, the people of Christ, the body of Christ, however you want to talk about that, the ancient uh, first communities of the church in Corinth, we always have this tendency to believe that we are the ones who should be making the decisions, that we are the ones who should be deciding what to plant, that we are the ones who, be, who should be deciding how much to plant and where to plant and how it should be watered and how it should be tended and how it should be harvested and what the harvest should be used for without realizing that what Paul is actually saying here is that we are what is being grown. We are the crop. We are the harvest. And so... I can't read this passage without thinking about that day because it reminds me that when I identify, when I read a passage and I'm like, where, where, with what do I identify here? I have a tendency to identify maybe with the person planting the seed or maybe with the person watering or maybe with whoever is going to decide what to do with the harvest. In reality, to use my other metaphor, I'm the cow. I'm what is being grown. I'm the crop. Just like you are the crop. You and I are what God is growing. Paul plants, Apollos waters, God grows. God grows that harvest into a harvest worth reaping. And so as a church, we've always had this tendency to believe that we decide what to plant. We decide where to plant it. We decide how it should be watered. We decide, uh, we reap the harvest, and then we take that harvest, and we decide how that harvest should be used. And all the while, Paul is saying, no, 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 that's not the case. You are what God is growing. You are the focus of God's effort. God does not need you. How amazing is that? God does not need you. God does not need me. There is nothing, get this, there is nothing in all of creation that God needs to accomplish that God cannot accomplish better by God's self than God can if God chooses to tell me to do it. God doesn't need me. God wants me. I am what God is growing. You are what God is growing. And yet we have this tendency to believe over and over again, generation, it's not just now, generation after generation after generation after generation, we have this tendency to believe that we are the ones in charge. We are the ones who should be deciding what to do with the harvest without realizing that we are the harvest. And it's God who, decided what, who decides what to do with what God rules. So that's why the other thing that Paul says here matters. He begins with a message where he's chastising Corinth, right? He's chastising them because they believe that they are the ones who should be making decisions about what to do. And so he talks to them, calls them unspiritual people. I want to use a little bit of a different metaphor to try to help that make sense to you so you can understand, I hope, what Paul is trying to say. It works like this. Um, I spent 
the first year or so that I was in the infantry as, uh, as the last M60 machine gunner in my platoon. They were transitioning away. I have some other grunts out here um, who would have used an M60. So if you don't know what that is, it is a very large belt-fed crew-served weapon. If that made no sense to you, it's a big rifle that shoots big rounds in rapid succession. And that means it's really loud. They were transitioning away from this and into the, the weapon that they're using now. And so um, I got put on this, this uh, machine gun. Now, when you are in the infantry, you are going to carry earplugs wherever you go. You're going to wear earplugs when you get on helicopters. If you've never been on a helicopter, there are two things you need to know. The first is it's really fun. When you sit in a helicopter and you, uh, you sit there right next to the open door, uh, you, you have beautiful views. Sometimes pilots will give you great rides, like being on a, on a roller coaster, really a lot of fun. It's also really, really loud. It's incredibly loud. So you wear earplugs while you're in because over time, those loud sounds begin to damage your hearing. Well, if you don't wear earplugs when you're firing a weapon like that, the, the residual noise from that weapon will keep you from being able to hear. Have you ever been to a concert? You go to a concert that's really, really loud and you can't hear very well for a full day or so after you've been to that concert, right? Same is true for this. So the first time I get onto this weapon and I'm qualifying at a range, trying to make sure that I can hit the targets that I'm shooting at. I didn't bring any earplugs, so I start shooting. And it's so loud, like incredibly loud. All I can hear for the next 24 hours is ringing. In 2004, Kate and I went to see Jeremy Camp in concert in Mobile, Alabama. Um, it is pronounced Mobile. If you call it Mobile, you're wrong. We go down to Mobile, Alabama, and Jeremy Camp's playing in concert there. And I've had this terrible cold. I don't know if you've had what's going around right now, but it's awful. I had this terrible cold. And so I get there. I, for two days, two solid days, both of my ears have been clogged. You know that feeling? There's all this pressure in, in your head. Your ears are terribly clogged. So I have this tendency to try to yawn a lot when my ears are clogged because I'm trying to you know, break, break that clog open. So I'm walking into the concert. And I yawn again, and my right side unclogs immediately. That is the best feeling on earth, when your ear begin, finally unclogs. But then I realize that only my right side unclogged, and my left side is still clogged, and now I feel like I'm walking lopsided into the concert, and it's not going to be you know, a great experience at all. Unhealthy spiritual behaviors clog your ears. That's what Paul is saying. Corinth, it is not okay to have intimate relations with your relative. Which probably makes sense to, to, to most of us here, right? He would also say, Corinth, it's not okay to pick and choose who can have communion. You might struggle with that. You know, for a long time, Methodists handed out wooden chips to people who were worthy of communion. No, what Paul actually talks about in this passage is exactly what the church of today deals with. So here's what he's saying. In a nutshell, Paul is saying, unhealthy spiritual behaviors clog your spiritual ears so that you can't clearly hear the Holy Spirit. That's how that works. Unhealthy spiritual behaviors clog your ears, your spiritual ears, so you can't hear the Holy Spirit. So what Paul is saying is this. First off, you are what God is growing. But you need to know that even if you were going to try to decide what to do with the harvest, which remember is you, if you were going to try to decide what to do with the harvest instead of letting God decide what to do with you as God is growing you into a harvest worth reaping, Paul is saying you can't hear the Holy Spirit anyway because your unspiritual behaviors are clogging your spiritual ears. What are those unspiritual behaviors? Paul says things like jealousy. And bitterness, you know, the biggest, one of the biggest issues the church in Corinth had was gossip, something that the church has always struggled with. When we choose to be bitter, when we choose to be jealous, when we choose to gossip, we struggle with clogging our spiritual ears. Here's how that works in the second service. I'm going to preach a little bit about gratitude today. When you spend the majority of your time complaining about something, you will train yourself 
to look for things to be discontent with. So if you're the kind of person, and pay attention, when you're talking to the people that you are closest to, if you find that you spend most of your time complaining about anything, doesn't matter what it is, you're training yourself, you're training your spirit, you're training your mind to look for places to be discontent. The same is true for the close relationships in your life. If you spend most of your time frustrated and upset about the things that annoy you about the person you love the most, what you're doing is training yourself to look for those things. You will look for whatever you spend your time thinking about. So in the second service when I'm talking about gratitude today, one of the things I'll share with the people in that service is that when you choose to look for reasons to be thankful, even though it may feel counterintuitive, what you end up doing is retraining your brain and retraining your spirit. Now instead of looking for reasons to be discontent, you begin looking for reasons to be grateful. It is a tremendous change in your attitude which has a direct impact on your quality of life. Paul says, when you do things like that, you're clogging your spiritual ears. You can't hear the Holy Spirit. So Paul says, it's time to change some of those behaviors. Stop being jealous. Stop arguing with one another. Stop gossiping. Stop being discontent. Stop complaining. Start looking for ways to be thankful for what you've been given, and remember that you are what is being grown in Christ. It's God who makes the decisions about what to do with the harvest because it's God that grows. Friends, if I could give you one challenge today, it would be this. Go home. Sit down in a place where you pray. As you've heard me say before, if there is not a place where you pray, start praying. Go home and sit down in a place where you pray. And say, God, would you help me to identify? Now, sometimes this has to happen on a community level, like a whole community has to say, God, what are our unspiritual, our unhealthy spiritual practices? And I'm going to encourage you to start on a personal level. Go home, sit down in a place where you pray, and say, God, what are the unhealthy spiritual behaviors that I'm engaging in? In what ways am I being bitter? In what ways am I looking for reasons to complain? In what ways am I being discontent? Where am I gossiping? What are the unhealthy spiritual behaviors that I haven't even identified that are keeping me from being able to hear you? When you ask a question like that, be ready. Be open. Let's pray together. Gracious and giving God, we're so thankful that We have opportunities to learn from places like Corinth where you remind us that we are not the ones who are in charge of what happens with the harvest, but we are what is being grown and harvested. So help us to grow from wherever we are, whatever it is that we need to do to grow into the people you're calling us to be, help us to do that. Help us in particular to identify those poisonous practices, those poisonous beliefs, those poisonous behaviors that are stunting our growth and keeping us from living into the fullness of life that you've had in mind for us from the very beginning. Particularly today, I lift up those who have a bitter heart. I pray that that bitterness, God, would be lifted so that it no longer poisons the soil in which they live. This I ask in your holy name. Amen. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly to, in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as Christ loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, we offer these prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Gracious God, there are so many times when our hearts turn away from you, when we become angry or judgmental, when we speak falsehoods, when we squander your blessings, and when we covet the things that are not ours. Forgive us. Help us speak words of encouragement and love. Help us to follow your ways, that we may be your faithful followers. In your holy name we pray. Our loving God has said, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. Choose life. Brothers and sisters, in the name of God, you are forgiven. Now choose life and turn your hearts toward God. Amen. God has blessed us with the gift of life. For the blessings that come in our lives, let us offer our thanks and show our gratitude to God through today's offering.
God of abundant life, we give you thanks for your many gifts. Most of all, thank you for the gift of life and for all the ways we are able to worship and to serve you. May these gifts bring abundant life to those both near and far. In your precious name, we pray. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go forth and choose life. Walk in the ways of Christ, be strengthened by the Holy Spirit, that the world might know the love and the peace of God. Go in peace. Amen. O Church of God, united to serve one common Lord, proclaim to all one message with hearts in glad accord. Christ ever goes before us. We follow day by day with strong and eager footsteps along the upward way. From every land and nation the ordered ranks appear to serve one valiant leader. They come from far and near. They chant their one confession. They praise one living Lord and place their sure dependence upon his saving word. Though creeds and tongues may differ, they speak, O Christ, of thee. And in thy loving spirit, we tell one people be. Lord, may our faithful service and single mass of aim proclaim to all the power of thy redeeming name. Make thy great prayer be answered that we may all be one. Those bound by love united in thee, God's blessed Son, to bring us in the witness to make the pathway bright that soul. 